Hello, my name is Paul Giera. I'm here with my dear friend and close colleague and co-author, Jerry Ron Colato. And we're gonna to talk to you about the American Sea Power Project. Um, uh, in just a few minutes, I wanna explain the rationale for the American Sea Power Project and uh, why we wrote the lead eponymous article that lays out the project. Uh, first, uh, at, at the end of the Vietnam War, the Navy had constructed and brilliantly uh, exercised a tremendous strategy enterprise. Then, uh, after the end of the Cold War, it disestablished it. It literally destructed it. Uh, it doesn't take much of an effort to correlate that demise of the strategic planning enterprise with the deterioration of awareness and intent uh, concerning American sea power. We believe that the great historical domestic bulwark of public and political support for American sea power has atrophied badly at precisely the time when it is going to be most needed. This brings us back to square one in debates we hope to inspire about American sea power. We consider American sea power to be unique and vital to the United States and the public, the Congress and the fleet need to hear and consider what is at stake and its great implications. Not for the first time, we're facing a dramatic shift in strategic circumstances, but for once it is a shift back to the future. That makes what the Navy planned and accomplished particularly relevant today. At the same time, we are seeing a dramatic shift in the character of war. In this regard, change is accelerating. The effect of the long lead of the Cold War has been that discussion and knowledge of the underlying principles and rationale for our Navy and options for its employment has atrophied, especially but not limited to the public and in the Congress. To the contrary, the current focus is on platforms and is technology centric but this puts the cart before the horse. Unlike Admiral Thomas Hayward's 1979 superb manifesto, recurring Navy strategic documents now are largely pro forma and not very useful. Successive CNOs seem to have foregone the opportunity and the responsibility to shape the public, political, and fleet consciousness regarding American sea power. We believe that what is needed is an ongoing debate about the role of sea power in maintaining American, American prosperity and security and how that role should shape planning, doctrine, force structure, acquisition, and technology. We took an historical approach in our lead article in the American Sea Power Project series because in our view, history is repeated and because our own unique maritime history provides a number of things that are very useful. First, a grand strategic perspective of great practical value, reminders of sea power worth and the, law and the consequences of the loss of sea power, an appreciation for the timeless constants of American sea power, especially the nature of that sea power, the particular and unique American principles and logic of sea power, and the ability to compare both then and now and between us and others the philosophy and rationale of American sea power, the principles and over there logic of that sea power, the rise and fall of maritime powers and pretenders, the past and present national and geostrategic circumstances that highlighted sea power, judging against history, our present analysis, policies, strategies, assumptions, and actions, and the great wisdom and judgment of our forebears. One thing is clear to us, the sort of American sea power we are considering is not unique as in terra incognita, but to us it is new and the intellectual and popular links to its past are greatly diminished. Our assertion is that an occlusion exists in current navalist and popular thinking about the unique virtues and value of American sea power. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of great thinkers out here, but because the enterprise was disestablished, they are not connected. There is no consistency, there's no coherence. These advantages that existed previously are vital and directly applicable to our current strategic circumstances and must be expressed clearly and widely. This is not an argument for a change in the character of the sea services and of naval warfare. 
those changes are continuous and must proceed accordingly. But there has been a rush to design the next ship, the next fleet, the next naval architecture, to write the next maritime strategy without first considering the essential and fundamental basis of American sea power. Rather, we believe that the nature of American sea power is particularly constant, that it carries with it tremendous geostrategic virtue, and that it imbues to the United States incalculable value to our security, economy, and way of life. This constant nature of American sea power must address and shape its changing character. It is our view that this strategic bulwark, the why and the ends of our great national maritime power must be reasserted publicly and among experts before the debate and arguments can turn to the ways and the means of American sea power. Clearly, it is not possible to debate, let alone determine the ways and means of our sea power before we decide what we intend to do with it. Admiral Hayward would insist on supremacy of American sea power as the watchword going forward. As just one example of getting it right, this is why Nick Lambert's forthcoming American Sea Power Project article in the April edition of Proceedings is so important. What is a Navy for? With the subtitle, to develop the right kind of fleet the nation needs to understand the Navy's purpose. That's our point exactly. Just to close the thought with an extreme example of Nick Lambert's point, Answering the key planning questions for American military and political strategic planners depends on what we have in mind for American sea power in the first place. Obviously, the answers will differ markedly if we are defending a, the approaches to San Francisco Bay, or conversely, if we are dominating the straits, headlands, archipelagos, capes, and littorals of key Eurasian maritime ge geography. In particular, we believe that the Navy must as it surely has in the past, foster and lead these national debates, not turn away from them and not hand over that leadership to someone else. Our sea power history is not just a dry intellectual exercise. It is eminently practical, lays out vital lessons, and now that we are back to great power competition, the history and nature of American sea power provides apt solutions for current challenges. Making that case is going is going to fall to those who will speak up and those who will in the naval as the naval institute exhorts us to do read think speak and write over to jerry uh, thank you paul and greetings uh, people and thank you for taking the time to join in on this discussion this panel discussion of our project and hopefully uh, we'll not only you'll not only get something out of the discussion but that you'll also uh, offer questions and thoughts and counterpoints because at the end of the day, what we're hoping for is not a proclamation from on high kind of transmit only uh, concept, but a debate, a discussion, a, a, a skin in the game kind of give and take across not just the naval community, but the government and the public at, at large. Uh, as Paul inferred in his comments, uh, I, the dramatic changes that are taking place, both uh, geopolitically, technologically, socially, fiscally, uh, demand fundamental reassessment of, of what we are as a Navy and, and Marine Corps and Coast Guard and what our purpose is. Um, typically, what we've been doing since, particularly since the end of the Cold War, is putting out maritime strategies on a uh, irregular basis every couple of years, but there's no commitment amongst anybody within the Navy, within the Naval Services to take action or even comment on those strategies. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a pronouncement from on high. And in the meantime, the sailors and Marines and Coast Guardsmen on the deck plates, as you will, if you will, are limited to just doing their day-to-day -day job and not worrying about the direction. What we hope to accomplish in this fundamental time of change or time of fundamental change is to in, in, encourage a debate about not just, as Paul mentioned, not just what ship types, what weapons, what technology, but what is the purpose and what is the value of American sea power to American security and prosperity. 
so this idea was discussed with the staff at the Naval Institute, uh, and uh, we came to an agreement on, on building a debate. This is something kind of new for, for the Naval Institute, because typically what in proceedings, what you'll see are, are publications of excellent articles that, uh, for lack of a better term, come over the transom. Uh, they are submitted because an author feels the need to contribute and comment, and then the, they are published. In this case, this debate that we are fostering is a series of commissioned pieces by well-known and respected naval authors. In this case, designed to explore the ends of American sea power. What is it for? What are, what are, what's the relationship with history? What is the relationship with the theory of naval and maritime warfare? Um, and so this is a year long effort, which is not something the proceedings has done in a very long time. Uh, and, and the idea is to put some quality work out there along the, a common theme and then in, 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 invite and hope for comments, pros and cons, uh, as people reflect at, at different levels in the Navy and in different areas of our society, reflect on, on just what it means to have a Navy and why we should, in, in, in fact, pay for one. Uh, so the debate structure uh, is basically going to be broken down into three separate components. The first one, which is this year, is the ends piece. Why a Navy? Next year uh, will be the ways piece, which is, what, is what, are the, what are the best maritime strategies to accomplish and support the ends of the Navy? And what th does that lead you to in terms of the kind of things you need to think about buying? And then the third year will be the means, so ends, ways, means. And that will be the, the topics that typically are what, what the naval community discusses, which is, do I build more Zoom walls? Do I build an FFG-62? Do I put more missiles on? Do I use direct energy weapons? Are they manned, unmanned? Is it distributed ops? All those kinds of concepts that are that are very familiar to those who pay attention to the Navy today. But we will have, in the course of two, two years of preceding study, we will have set the stage in context in a way that respects the changing circumstances that we face as a nation, as a Navy. Bottom line is, Business as usual is not going to get the job done. We can't afford to do it uh, fiscally, and and too much is changing to say the, for example, a carrier centric uh, strike group complex is the only way forward. I don't know if it is or not. I just say that with the way the world is changing, it suggests that we need to rethink that very carefully. So I encourage uh, those of you in the audience uh, to to jump into the game. This is not. We, we don't want to make this just a bunch of uh, people writing articles and then moving on. This is something to stimulate discussion and debate. And we hope that you will put your skin in the game. You will engage and you will add comment. And I'm not just talking to the, the naval community, the retired community or Congress, or I'm talking to the deck plate sailors, the Marine infantrymen and the Coast Guardsmen, because you guys are on the tip of the spear and you have ideas that need to be brought into play here. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the program.